Hello and welcome to Railway Engineering. My name is Dr Mark Taylor, lecturer in Civil Engineering. So this is Unit 2 and in this unit we're going to look at the rail and this is part one of two. So before we start we'll just do a quick recap of some of the technical terms that we learned in the previous unit that we're going to continue and build upon in this unit. So the first term is track gauge and this is the distance between the running edges not the center of the two rails. It's used to keep the rails a set distance apart to minimize wear and maintain the vehicle stability. The structure gauge is a set of minimum dimensions relative to the track to which any structure must conform. The loading gauge is a set of dimensions that load on a rail vehicle must be within to run in normal traffic. Clearance is the difference between the structure gauge and the loading gauge at any point. The UIC is an international organisation which is a union of various railway companies and administrations and it agrees common standards and practices. So in this unit we're going to look at the rail. We're going to look at the shape and geometry of the rail section. We're going to look at the subject of metallurgy. We're going to look at the rail as a beam and we're also going to look at how the rails wear. So during this unit, I aim to describe the process of the manufacturing of rail steel, introduce the chemicals that alter the properties of the rail steel, and introduce the shape and geometry of the rail. So at the end of this lesson, you should be able to summarise the phases of iron and relate them to rail steel properties. You'll be able to explain the effects of additives to rail steel on its strength, and deconstruct the shape of the rail and specify an appropriate rail section for a specific application. So before we go any further let's just remind ourselves of some of the definitions that we're going to use in this unit. Let's start by looking at the subject of stress and strain. Stress is the force per unit area affected. So stress equals the force divided by the area. The basic units are newtons per square metre and also one newton per square metre equals one pascal. Strain, if a force is applied to a metal bar and marked in equal divisions, every division will change by the same amount. Therefore strain is a ratio and strain can be calculated by the change in length over the original length. The relationship between stress and strain is governed by Hooke's law, where the stress divided by the strain is equal to the Young's modulus. Young's modulus varies by material type. Young's modulus for rail steel is typically 2.069 times 10 to the power of 5 newtons per millimeter squared. With cyclic loading from trains, the relationship between stress and strain is very important in railway engineering. Plastic deformation of track components can affect integrity and this then may result in track failure and or the derailment of trains. So we're now going to have a look at the production of iron and steel for use in the rail sector with particular attention to the manufacturing of rails. Iron ore is principally iron oxide. The iron ore is mixed with carbon, coke or charcoal, and a flux, limestone, and heated in a blast furnace. The carbon and coke burns and produces carbon monoxide and heat. Carbon monoxide is a highly reducing gas. It reduces iron oxide to iron. The iron melts quickly due to the heat, and other impurities float to the top, and this is known as slag, which is removed. Molten iron is tapped off at regular intervals. Pig iron, which has still got the carbon trapped in it. So what happens to this trapped carbon? The diagram on the left here is what's called a phase diagram. 
and a phase is a state of matter. Example states of matter include solid, liquid or gas, but also crystalline structures. The lines shown are where the different phases are in equilibrium. So pure iron at room temperature is known as alpha iron. It's in a crystalline form, it's moderately hard and ductile, it's also magnetic. Whereas heated pure iron, known as gamma iron, the arrangement of the atoms changes, the volume changes, it's softer and more ductile, and it's also not magnetic. If iron is allowed to cool slowly, this process is reversed. In a blast furnace, the iron will contain a certain percentage of carbon from the process. As liquid iron cools from the furnace, it takes gamma form or a stentite. Gamma iron can take up to 1.7% carbon. Any excess forms cementite or Fe3C. On cooling, austenite transforms to alpha iron, ferrite plus perlite and cementite. Perlite is a layered structure composing alternate layers of ferrite and cementite. Depending on cooling rate and other elements present, various structures of iron can be formed. Steel is an alloy of iron, containing a small percentage of carbon and other elements such as manganese. Steel is made by blowing oxygen through molten pig iron to reduce the carbon content. Proportion of free cementite reduces until 0.8% carbon, where it starts to become a mixture of perlite and ferrite if slowly cooled. In steelmaking, the hardness of the steel is proportionate to the cementite content. For example, a file would have a carbon content of about 1.3%, a pre-stressing tendon 0.8%, and a rolled steel joist or beam section about 0.1% carbon. Wearing rails comprise between 0.4% and 0.8% carbon. Steel rails are usually referred to as perlitic and they have a medium to high carbon content. So we're now going to look at some of the modern methods used for manufacturing rails. So historically, Steel was poured into ingot casts to form the rail, but the process has now changed. Newly smelted iron is taken directly from the blast furnace instead of pouring into ingots to cool. Blooms are made directly from converted steel by feeding into rectangular tubes into which molten steel flows, and this is the process of continuous casting. Blooms can be stored, transported, and reheated as required. This image shows steel blooms being transported by rail. The process of continuous casting also eliminates piping. The rolling process enhances the steel by homogenizing it. This diffuses alloys, closes holes, cracks and porosity and improves the properties in the direction of the roll. So now I want you to watch the short video showing the rolling of hot steel sections into rail sections. There is also a quiz and a series of questions that I want you to try and answer whilst you watch the video. So whilst you're watching this short video, I want you to answer a couple of questions. Part one of the quiz is, how are the steel blooms descaled? Why are stamps and markings important? And how long does the rail take to cool? So part two of the quiz, why is eddy current slash ultrasonic testing used? And what does the reheating and accelerated cooling process do? So watch the short video clip and see if you can answer the questions. Okay, so here are the answers to part one of the quiz. The steel blooms are descaled by using high pressure water jets. The stamps and markings on the rails allow the rails to be physically tracked over time. And this is important for asset management. So we know how long the rail has been in place and in use. The rails typically take around three hours to cool. So 
So, part two of the quiz, here are the answers. We use eddy current and ultrasonic testing to check the external and internal integrity of the rail section. The reheating and accelerated cooling process enhances wear resistance with low residual stresses. So now we're going to have a look at the chemical composition of steel used in making rail sections. The table below shows a typical chemical composition of steel used in making rails. The carbon content is typically between 0.4 and 0.8%. The greater the carbon content, the greater the increase in hardness and resistance to wear. However, greater carbon content reduces the ductility of the steel. Manganese, the greater the manganese content, the greater the hardness and also increased tensile strength. Chromium, typically 1% of the steel, provides high tensile strength, hardness and wear resistance. Silicon is found naturally in parts of the steel making and welding processes. It reduces the resilience of the steel. Phosphorus and sulphur are also present in steel. Both are naturally occurring in iron ore and difficult to eliminate altogether. Sulphur is quite a big problem. At high temperatures, the sulphur combines with iron to form iron sulphide. The iron sulphide is soluble in molten steel, but can't form a solid with it when it cools. The sulphur can improve machinability, but lowers transverse ductility and notched impact toughness. The iron sulphide ends up rejecting solidifying steel as it cools, and it's deposited as a thin layer along grain boundaries, rendering it useless. This electron microscope image shows the iron sulphide deposited on the surface of the steel. To prevent the formation of iron sulphide, manganese is added to steel at the conversion stage, and this forms manganese sulphide. Manganese sulphide is insoluble in steel and therefore mostly floats, so we can scrape it off the surface as part of the slag. The remaining manganese sulphide is distributed in independent globules throughout the steel and solidifies in this form. Again here we can see an electron microscope image showing the formation of manganese sulphide in paralytic steel. Nitrogen can be absorbed in the steel making process, particularly so when air rather than oxygen is used in the blast furnace. The nitrogen dissolves in molten steel liquid and having a small atomic size locates between the iron and carbon atoms. This then creates an interstitial atom. This increases the strength of the steel but reduces its ductility. Water may come into contact with steel during the production process. The hydrogen can move freely within the liquid and solidified steel because of the size of the atom being the smallest. Hydrogen is attracted to small voids and as molecules gather can start exerting pressure on the surrounding steel. If present, it can form cracks known as hydrogen flakes or shatter cracks. And when the rail is in service, these cracks initiate fatigue cracks and ultimately failure known as Tachio Valley. This is one of the main manufacturing defects that can occur in rails. If carbon steel is made red hot and then cooled very quickly, it becomes extremely hard. It's then possible to grind a very sharp edge, which, which will stay very sharp. The process is known as quenching, and it can be done with water, air or oil. Rapid cooling means the carbon atoms have insufficient time to combine with the iron, a cementite, and formation of perlite is no longer possible. Surplus carbon gets trapped in a crystalline structure and distorts it. The resultant steel is harder than perlite or astentite. If sufficient carbon is present, an extremely hard material known as martensite. The problem with martensite is it's not only hard but very brittle, so that's not good for rails. Rail manufacturers must ensure that cooling is controlled. Martensite can occur when rails are in situ, for example when they get very hot 
and then are quickly cooled. Examples could include wheel burns or uncontrolled welding, and these rails will crack very quickly under traffic. Wheel burns are difficult to correct, as you cannot control cooling. Welding, however, should be done in a controlled manner. It's been discovered that by adding high quantities of manganese to steel, austenitic structure could be preserved during quenching processes. The resulting austenitic manganese steel, or AMS, becomes very hard when worked. AMS is used extensively in castings for crossings and heavy traffic sections. Plain line rail, subject to defects in manufacture, though so not now widely used. The issue with welding AMS to paralytic steel the different structures result in a brittle joint. It's generally fish plated to adjacent rail instead, although butt welding techniques have been developed. So bionetic steel can be produced by adding boron and molybdenum. It suppresses the austenite perlite transformation and austenite transforms to bainite on cooling. Bainite is similar to perlite, but the grain is much finer meaning that toughness and hardness are increased. And due to similar properties of perlite, it can be welded if cooling is controlled. Therefore, this is good for crossings. So I'm now just going to summarise some of the real steel terminology that we've just learned. Austenitic manganese steel, or AMS, is a very hard steel manufactured by the addition of manganese prior to quenching. It's used in high wear situations such as tight radius curves and switches and crossings. Bionitic steel is another hard form of steel formed by the addition of boron and molybdenum. It's sometimes used in crossings. Unlike AMS, it's easy to weld to paralytic steel. Martensite is a very hard but very brittle form of steel. It's formed when the steel is quickly cooled in an uncontrolled way and in the absence of manganese. Shatter cracks are formed as a result of hydrogen being present in the steel, and it's usually from the use of water during the manufacturing process. It's likely to lead to the eventual failure of the steel in use. So now we're going to have a close look at the shape or the geometry of the rail section. So let's have a look at the primary and secondary purposes of the rail section. The primary purpose is to act as a hard and unyielding surface to carry a rigid tired wheel without rutting or abrasion. It also acts as a beam and transmits the wheel loads to the sleepers. It also acts with the tread and flange of the wheel tire in steering the vehicle in the desired direction. The secondary purpose is to return traction current can also be used to carry electrical currents for signalling purposes in the form of a track circuit. So let's now look at the rail shape and the general terms used to describe the rail section. If you look at the image on the left, this is what's known as flat bottom rail, with the foot, the web and the head. Another section of rail is the bull head rail. Now this is now obsolete, but you may see sections of bullhead rail if you come up to Bone S and work with the permanent way crew. So you can see a more detailed drawing of a flat bottom rail section. Again, showing the rail head, but also identifying the fishing surfaces, the fillet radii, and it also shows the wheel and how the flange of the wheel interacts with the rail head. So the rail head is designed to fit well with the wheel tyre and maximise ride quality and minimise contact stresses. It's the point of contact between the wheel and the rail and is very close to the centre of the rail, thus minimising the eccentrically lo applied loads. It has sides which slope outwards at 1 in 20 and this compensates for the 1 in 20 inward slope of the rail, making it simpler to control gauge. Fishing surfaces 
maximise the efficiency of the fish plate in transmitting the longitudinal forces associated with bending of the rail under load. The rail web is thick to give sheer strength and to avoid fatigue failures, particularly in fish bolts. The generous transitions between head, foot and web are designed to provide sheer strength and avoid fatigue on curves. The rail foot is broad and gives stability against rollover. The flat underneath is to distribute wheel reaction evenly over the base plate. The planar surface is to minimise contact stresses between the clip and the rail. In most applications, a rail is supported at discrete intervals by sleepers, with a pad or steel base plate between the rail and the sleeper. The rail can therefore be seen as a beam. Areas of head, foot and web are determined by the need to resist against bending. The beam is also subject to dynamic loading, therefore repeated bending and shear reversals, so it's prone to fatigue. Over the course of time, wear on the rail and corrosion will lead to a loss of the rail section. The strength, moment of inertia and depth of the rail is determined by considering bending moments produced by known wheel loads, accounting for sleeper spacing. So just like you would select a beam or a column section, we have different choices of rail sections. And now we're going to have a look at how we would select an appropriate rail section. So the rail sections have principal characteristics and they are the weight per unit length and the moment of inertia. Cross sections are standardised by UIC. For example, UIC 50 is 50.18 kilograms per metre and a UIC 60 is 60.34 kilograms per metre and so on. In European standards, it's stated as weight followed by a serial number for example, 50E1 is equivalent to UC, UIC50. The table shown is an extract from the British Steel Rail Technical Guide on EN 13674 Part 1 Flat Bottom Rails, greater than 46 kg per metre. The choice of rail section depends on the speed, the axle loading, the traffic, the sleeper spacing and the life expectancy of the rail section. Individual rail authorities produce their own guidelines. So typically in Europe, a low traffic railway would see the use of UIC 54, medium traffic, UIC 54 for timber sleepers or UIC 60 for concrete sleepers and for highly trafficked railways, UIC 60. The table shown shows the grades of steel used in UIC rail sections. The UIC rail grades are based on tensile strength and the chemical composition is shown as a percentage. European rail grades are specified in EN 13674 part 1. The chemical composition is stated, the mechanical strength is similar to the UIC system, and hardness is specified using the Brunel scale for HB. So the choice of rail hardness should take into account the curve radius and the traffic loading. The guidance will vary depending on the rail authority. Heavy axle loads may require higher tensile strength and hardness. So that's the end of Unit 2, Part 1. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.